Thank you very much for having me back here on the Inspire Fest stage. I've got a couple of minutes to talk to you about STEM and STEAM for the many and what that's meant um, for our journey, but also for the future of, of humankind. So to start off there, um, Anne mentioned a little bit about my upbringing and my childhood. Uh, this is the obligatory baby photo there on the left. Wasn't I so cute? Um, I'm about four years old in that photo, and it's taken in East London. Anyone here ever been to East London? Um, it's a slightly better place than, than this part of Dublin, maybe. Controversial uh, me saying that. Uh, but I grew up in East London and um, always loved understanding how things work and getting creative with them. So at about that age, some of you here, not many of you, but some of you will remember VCR players. Yeah, we had one at home, and I, I took it apart so I could learn how it worked. Um, and thank goodness for my parents, my dad didn't kill me. Uh, he understood that it was this inquisitive nature that I had in me. Um, and so as Anne mentioned, I then um, did some GCSEs at 10, uh, did an A-level um, at 11, and ended up working in technology, working in the industry, and really, really enjoying myself. Um, so this photo um, down here in the, in the middle is actually at Deutsche Bank offices. Um, and the photo on the right, I'm not wearing the same outfit. Um, and you can all see I own a different necklace as well. Um, but STEM and technology is always something I've done and always something I've enjoyed. And it was something that I studied. And for me, the reason why I find everything that I do, everything that we're doing here, so exciting is because there are so many different elements and different theories and different concepts and different ideas that have been um, studied over the years from prime numbers to things like the Internet of Things here and robotics and autonomous vehicles. And all these things that were in the lab, all these things that were just academic ideas and projects and explorations are now becoming reality. So it's this idea that science fiction is becoming all of our realities. And it means that it's not something that needs to just be reserved for a certain few or a small group. It's something that's impacting all of us, that's impacting the many. So it is very important that we have STEM and STEAM, including the arts, for the many. So as Anne mentioned, um, my solution to making sure that the many, that the all, um, were participating in STEM was, was co-founding the STEMETs. Um, the numbers are widely reported. I think in Ireland it's only 25% of those working in STEM industries um, are women. And that's just not good enough because 51% of those living in, the, in this science reality world uh, are women. And we need to be shaping and creating um, as much as everyone else is. So this is Stemets. It's now 40,000 girls over the last five years that we've reached from the ages of five all the way up to 21, introducing them to STEM in environments that are free for them to attend, fun for them to be in, and where there's food. <laughs> um, because everybody loves free food, um, and that's the easiest way to pack a room. You know, how many of you are here because of the free food? Um, so that's what we do, that's what we've done, and we've exposed them to role models, introduced them to all kinds of people and to all kinds of spaces, because it's very important for them to see where these things happen and understand that it's not necessarily just that you need to be dead, white, and male to be able to contribute um, to the STEM industry, which is the image that gets portrayed, portrayed so often. And so when we talk about it being important for the many to be involved um, for the future, there's kind of two examples that I like to point to um, that illustrate why you have to have everyone be a part of this innovation and this creation and this uh, exploration. Um, so on the left, that is a photo of me uh, in a different dress as well, noted. Um, and stood next to, um, some of you may recognize, this is uh, our friend John, who was the voice of Siri up until uh, a couple of versions ago. He got replaced, sadly, by another voice artist. Um, but for him, or this picture for me, signifies uh, voice recognition technology, which all of you will be familiar with. Now you kind of talk to your phone or you talk to devices, um, and they listen to you, and they understand what you're saying. Which, for those of you that remember ye olde Siri, you'll know that it didn't always work like that. So you'll remember, you know, Siri, give me directions to Inspire Fest. And it would say back, you know, did you say give me ice cream? And you'd be like, that's nothing like what I said. Um, and, it's, and it was because of the different types of voice data, different type, um, types of training that they put on those algorithms that meant that it didn't uh, recognize lots of different voices, different inflections, and different dialects. Um, so they needed to make sure that that technology was inclusive 
and had different types of data and different types of things fed into it for it to take off. Uh, the other example I like to give here are seat belts and airbags, which again are now compulsory when you're riding in, in certain vehicles. Um, and the initial teams of engineers that worked on them, you know, there's the famous, famous anecdote that they kind of built them to the height and the weight and the spec of the average man. And some of you won't fit that kind of average height, weight, and spec of the average man because you might not be the average man. You might be a woman or a child. And so these seatbelts actually killed women and children. So it's quite important that as we go forward with our innovations, with our creations, with what we're making, with you know, these things like this, this kind of autonomous vehicles becoming more and more uh, reality, we make sure that we are inclusive in what we're building. You know, I don't want to be in the seatbelt equivalent stuck in my driverless car and end up being killed just because it didn't realize that my hair was slightly longer and so it would take longer for me to get out of the car or whatever example there might be. And there's so many new technologies that we have coming up where there's, there's opportunities um, abound, and we won't talk about the threats, but the opportunities abound. So I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the technologies that we're excited about, some that we're showing to the girls and allowing them to get creative with, um, and other ones where we need to make sure that we are including altruism and creativity in what we're doing. So this first example, I'm going to let it play. <laughs> Who wants one of those? <laughs> who wants it hooked up to their Instagram instead? And for the millennials amongst you, who wants it hooked up to Snapchat? Um, so this is Molly. Uh, Molly is a great example that we like to talk about that um, represents Internet of Things, which, of course, um, many of you will be familiar with, many of you will have worked with. And this is something that, again, used to be, um, you know, even though this is a frivolous uh, use case for it, it used to be uh, a niche thing. It used to be something that was kind of just to the side that we'd explore, um, but is becoming a bigger and bigger um, part of everyday life. Um, at least in London, all our buses are connected to the internet. Many of you would have ordered things from Amazon and ASOS before, um, and there are endless possibilities um, for what we have in IoT and what we have um, in terms of options. But there are also endless unintended consequences, the biggest of which is security and privacy, which we've seen a lot of kind of regulation um, more recently about. But if you kind of look up um, online, I don't have enough time to show all the videos, but there's all kinds of, of things that can happen when you open up a device to the internet and allow others to be able to see it. And what are we doing, what are we building as we go along to make sure that um, you know, we're keeping safe and we're being mindful in what we're creating. So that's one example I'd like to, to show you. Uh, before we play the video, I'm going to explain what this next one is. So this is Brad. Um, and these are videos and, and kind of examples that we like to show the girls to kind of you know, get their minds uh, going. This is Brad. Brad stands for the Berkeley Ridiculously Automated Dorm Room. Um, so this is a student at Berkeley College who's automated their room. Um, they've got homework mode, which means that all the lights go off and the light on the desk comes on. They've got sleep mode, which means that the curtains close, the lights go off and their alarm goes on. And this is party mode. If we can hit play. So they hit the emergency party button, which every good room should have. The curtains close, the lights go off, and then... Disco ball ready and waiting. And my favorite bit is coming up. So you can see the curtains are closed there. They've even got a fog machine ready to go. Um, which in the interest of safety, again, maybe uh, it's slightly questionable to have a fog machine in your room. But again, who would want one of these? <laughs> Who's going to go and build one at work under the pretenses of uh, exploring automation? Um, so again, automation is another uh, big area that we have that's coming, um, and 
the other thing that I end up talking about quite a lot is the future of work. So what happens to work when you've got all these technologies to come and, and do the things that humans are doing at the moment? So again, there's a lot of opportunities right for the picking, but we do need to think about what we're building. And just because you can build something, should you build it? Kind of bringing the ethics um, back into it. Um, I'm going to skip through and talk about the kind of the biggest elephant in the room when we talk about jobs, when we talk about STEM for the many, and when we talk about the future, and this is artificial intelligence. Um, I'm sure in the lineup we've got other um, experts coming to talk about it, um, but there's many examples, actually we can roll this video, um, of where now the more that we are digital in what we do, the more that the world is able to be kind of codified and the more data that we generate, uh, the more that we're allowed to, or we're able to allow algorithms to do things on our behalf. So AV, if we can play this video, um, I'm going to talk over it. So this is from DeepMind, Google's DeepMind um, AI uh, startup that they've acquired. Um, and they, uh, some of you will remember, this is the Brick Breaker game that you used to have on your BlackBerry when you first got it. Um, and they trained this algorithm to play the game um, and kind of got it to learn over time. So it got to do what many of us, I guess, would like to do, which was just to play this game over and over and over and over and over again, but to learn the rules as it went. And so you can see kind of the first 100, first 200, first 400 games. It's kind of learning what happens, how the score goes up, how it moves, and how everything kind of fits together. And what it notices at 600 um, is because it's not analyzing it as a human would, it's analyzing it kind of just from the numbers in the algorithms in the background, it realizes that if it breaks the side of, sides of the walls and allows the, ba the ball to bounce at the top, that it can get to a higher score quicker. How many of you had worked that out before? How many of you did it for 600 hours? <laughs> to be able to get there. So this algorithm has figured it out um, on its own. And you know, this is a small, closed system. This is a very specific um, algorithm, but we are you know, approaching um, general intelligence where algorithms are, are doing more and more. Um, there's this example that we have of Iva. If I can go back to my slides. Um, so again, this is a great video you can find on YouTube where you know, many of the, much of the music that we're using in movies now, a lot of, um, this was kind of for the Danish 100 year anniversary of something. They got this algorithm called IVA, the artificial intelligence virtual agent that composed this wonderful piece of classical music, which if I were to play it for you now, you wouldn't even know that it was an algorithm that put it together. So there's this question about, you know, what will the bots be doing? What will they be taking over? Will they be getting citizenship? Should we treat them as humans? This, is, of course, is the, the kind of Sophia example. Um, but I guess I wanted to close with what do we do? How do we prepare? How do we ensure that we've got STEM for the many? Um, of course, we're at InspireFest. Um, there's a lot that needs to be done in terms of perception. Um, so if we look at this picture on the right, who sees a princess? Who sees an engineer? Does anyone not know what they're looking at? Um, you know, we need to play with our perception, what we see. We've got some fantastic toys and all kinds of things that are being done um, in education. But as a society, this is something we need to be mindful of what we're consuming. So it was really heartening to see things like Hidden Figures, uh, Wrinkle in Time, which I know Taylor's been involved with. But what other portrayals do we have or can we have um, of the different types of people who aren't just dead, um, who aren't just white, who aren't just male, um, who have contributed um, to STEM so that we can allow others to do it. Um, but most, but more, um, more <laughs> in the more short term, the other thing we should be doing and can be doing more of is mentoring and sponsoring of the next generation. Um, so this is a photo of a real human being, even though it looks like a doll. Um, this is, uh, I, no one has to admit that they've ever seen this show, but this is Eden from Toddlers and Tiaras. Um, and she is a pageant, uh, she's a, a young pageant queen. Um, and she started when she was ridiculously younger than even me taking my GCSEs. And the interesting thing about her, for me, she symbolizes sponsorship, um, which is that you know, she didn't decide as a two or three year old that she wanted to be a beauty queen. Someone saw that in her and you know, told her, let's wear these fake eyelashes, let's put all of this makeup on, you've got to walk like this. You can tell I've, I've been a beauty pageant before. Um, you've got to walk like this, and you know, they told her what to do, and they sponsored her into that um, position of being that beauty queen. Um, and I'm not saying that we should all be 
you know, creating a generation of beauty queens, but what's our equivalent? Who can you sponsor? Who can you help? Which young women around you can you be sponsoring and be acting um, on their behalf? Um, which is what we've been doing with Deutsche Bank, who are really, really um, pleased to be here with. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of Inspire Fest.